Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest this week is Hale Dwoskin. Welcome, Hale. Uh, welcome. Well, thanks for being doing this. It's fun. Oh, yeah. Totally fun. Um, I'll just read a short written bio of Hale, and then you'll get to know him a lot better during the interview. Um, Hale is a New York Times best-selling author of The Sedona Method, who is featured in The Letting Go Movie, which I was just watching this morning until the cat escaped, and I had to run around on my bicycle and <laughs> find the cat. <laughs> I did. She was in, in the neighbor's garage. Uh, <laughs> How did the neighbor like that? The neighbor didn't know. <laughs> oh, boy, that's probably good. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Hale is the CEO and director of, tra of training of the Sedona Training Associates, an organization that teaches courses based on the emotional releasing techniques inspired by his mentor, Lester Levinson. Hale is an international speaker and featured faculty member at Esalen and the Omega Institute. He is also one of the 24 featured teachers of the book and movie phenomenon The Secret, as well as a founding member of the Transformational Leadership Council. Over three decades, he has, been, he has regularly been teaching the Sedona Method to individuals and corporations throughout the U.S. and the U.K., and leading coach trainings and advanced retreats since the early 1990s. I was going to say 1900s. I thought, no, that doesn't <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm feeling old, but not that old. Yeah, right, yeah the Sedona Method is miraculous, man. You were born in, born in 1860. And you're going strong. That's right. <laughs> he is also the co-author with Lester Levinson of Happiness is Free and It's Easier Than You Think, a five-book series. So that's good enough for a bio, and we'll get to know right. Hale more as we go through the interview. <clears throat> so I guess it would be most appropriate for us, for you, to give us a kind of a nutshell understanding of what the Sedona method is, and then we can trace its history and your experience with it and all that stuff. Oh, sure, sure. Well, basically what the Sedona method is, is a bridge. Uh, it's a bridge between traditional self-help and even psychology and, and non-duality. Uh, most techniques and most teachers think that you have to choose one or the other. And one of the unique things about the Sedona Method is it shows you how to deal with the instrument, how to deal with the body-mind world, and at the same time to recognize the truth of who you are. And they're not mutually exclusive. Uh, I, I've met many people who have had tastes of non-duality, and they may even be leading satsang about it, but their lives are a mess. And I've met a lot of other people in the self-help space who, like even some of my friends who, in The Secret, where they're very sweet people, they're very loving people, they're in the top one percentile on the planet, but they're ignoring non-duality. They're, they're trying to just simply make a better dream, and then probably not even seeing it as a dream. Hmm. So what the Sedona Method is, it's a tool that shows you, wherever you are, whether you're... Um, whether you are trying to make more money or have a better relationship or have more radiant health, or you really just want to find those last remaining tendencies or vasanas that are pulling you back from that non-dual experience. Because what I've noticed is that people who have a non-dual experience uh, uh, don't realize that, that it can be a living part of every moment experience. They they have a non-dual experience and they, they know it clearly enough so they can talk about it anytime they need to, but it's not their living experience every moment. And the only reason for that is because they're still unresolved, in the East they call them samskaras and vasanas, mm -hmm. because they haven't cooked all the seeds. And some of the seed cooking happens naturally. but. A lot of the seed cooking can be uh, nurtured along, and that's exactly what the Sedona Method does. It's a way to rapidly dissolve the seeds that prevent you from knowing that that you are all there is. And this is another thing that happens too is, and so whether your goal is a worldly goal or whether your goal is a spiritual goal, the process is the same because the 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 samskaras and vasanas are the same. Or another way of saying it, in the East they call it the gunas, mm -hmm. the, 
the the three gunas. There's the sattva, uh, which everyone's aspiring to. There's rajas, <laughs> which you you can't live without and and function in the world. And there's tamas, which or inertia. And what happens with the Sedona method is it helps you naturally and spontaneously dissolve uh, tamas or have it merge into rajas and dissolve rajas and have it merge into sattva. And that all happens naturally as you let go. You don't have to try to make that happen. Uh, unfortunately, often in the East, they try to force that. They try to, uh, and the mind rebels. But if you naturally let go of the tamas and the rajas, the inertia and the, the compulsive doingness, then what's left over is sattva. And then you can actually go beyond that too. That's a great explanation. Um, there's a quote at the beginning of your DVD from Lao Tzu. He says, "To the mind that is still, the whole universe surrenders." Right. And uh, and I was, imp- <laughs> you know, I, I, it, it's great. And I've listened to hours of your talk and your your, your whole process that you put people through. And um, I also listened to your interview with Terry Patton um, on Beyond Awakening. And yes. I and I I was I must say impressed with the the way in which you integrated the the kind of the practical and the non-dual, you know, the manifest and the unmanifest. Because yes. as you said, a lot of teachers kind of emphasize one to the exclusion of the other. Right. And, uh, you know, you, I've interviewed a lot of people and there, there are a number of them who will say their whole emphasis is you are not a person, there's nobody home, there's nothing to do, there's, you know, and there's, that's the whole focus. But, you know, stick stick a pin in their leg and they're going to somehow realize that there is a person there. <laughs> <laughs> well, not necessarily. Well, I have to explain. The problem is most people who speak about non-duality are doing one of two things. They're either speaking from the non-dual space completely, mm-hmm. in which case, of course, there is no person and there's no debate about that. Or they're speaking from the place of knowing there is no person from a direct experience, but they haven't dealt with the person. Mm. And unfortunately, there's many more of those. And so it doesn't ring true. Like, for instance, Nisargardatta could talk that way and get away with it. Ramana Maharshi can talk that way and get away with it because just their living presence is a continuous invitation to that non-dual experience. Right. Whereas with a lot of teach and and there are some teachers that's true too, but with a lot of teachers, I, they they experience non-duality when they're in front of a room, mm. when they're being invited to take on that mantle. Mm-hmm. Part of the reason they like doing it is because it it invites them back into that non-dual experience. Mm-hmm. But they're avoiding their lives. They're mm-hmm. not dealing with life, and it also creates. I I, there, I, I don't remember the the. The, the term for it, but it it, it, they, it creates the non-dual speak, which is total craziness. Yeah, advita speak. Advita speak, that's right. right. It, it, that advita speak is, honestly, is just total bullshit. Yeah, I know, like, please pass the salt. Who wants the salt? Right. <laughs> 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 It's so silly. <laughs> it's just silliness. Because as long as there's a body-mind mechanism, there is still human experience. It's just that when the, the more you're surrendered or the more there is no sense of a separate you, one, the less they're suffering. That's why everyone wants that. Right. But the, 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 the more... Life just happens naturally and spontaneously, and if it's if you're not experiencing that, then you're experiencing conceptual non-duality, mm-hmm. which unfortunately is extremely prevalent right now. Tell me about for, it. For both teachers, and also for the people who follow these teachers, because they're what they are is they're uh, Lester Levinson, my mentor, and I'll talk about. Well, remind me to talk about him. Oh, we will. Yeah. Uh, where Lester Levinson used to talk about how people try to skip rajas. They try to skip activity. And they, they're in tamas. They're in apathy, grief, and fear with a little bit of lust. And they're trying to skip lust, anger, pride, courageousness and jump into acceptance and peace. Mm. And they pretend, they go around yeah. pretending they're in acceptance and peace. 
Whereas it, it, they are only able to maintain that when the world is going exactly the way they want it to. Hmm. I can't and, quote it. Ver- oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I was just going to say, I can't, can't quote them verbatim, but there's a couple of verses in the Gita pertaining to that where, you know, one of them is at a certain stage, activity is the means, and then later on at another stage, silence is the means. Right. But you don't kind of jump to the the final stage if you have some other things to transition through. And this, this thing about the conceptual thing, I actually moderated a forum out at the Science and Non-Duality Conference about this as a... Uh, Tibetan saying, which I've repeated a million times, which is, don't mistake understanding for realization. Right. Don't, don't mistake realization for liberation. And that there's such a prevalent tendency in my experience that people, you know, you, you can get a, an intuitive sense of non-duality. I mean, we're, we're, we're fish swimming in that ocean. And so if, right. you, if you read a book or two uh, and listen to a couple of YouTube videos, yeah, I get it. You know, I feel that. But it's not the full embodied experience of it. And a lot of people make the mistake of assuming that it is and begin sort of terrorizing the chat groups with their no- <laughs> with, with their knowledge, you know. <laughs> One of the things I've always stayed away from mm-hmm. is uh, chat, groups. Always, uh, chat groups. Chat groups. <laughs> yes, I stay away from those. Uh, what I've stayed away from, this has been a conscious decision, no matter how profound the non-dual experience that's happening here, Mm -hmm. I have never been willing to, and I probably will never be willing to, take on the mantle of a teacher in that way or do satsang. Hmm. Because there's there's, there's just this unevenness that happens from that. I'd rather lead a seminar where we're equals, and I'm just helping you with whatever it is that's appropriate for you in this moment. Because it, it keeps us talking like human beings and acting like human beings. And there's, in my experience, you need the, the direct experiential knowingness, but you also need to deal with the physical, mm-hmm. and you need to, need to deal with the, uh, the emotional, and you also need to deal with the energetics. And unfortunately, most of the people that I know of in the non-dual space are dealing just with the knowledge. Mm. And on even the ones who are fully genuine in that the knowledge is their living experience, the, their audience is not getting it because they, they need everything in order to really function. Mm. Yeah, there's another, you, you remind me of another verse in the Gita where it says, The wise do not delude the ignorant by speaking of the uninvolved nature of the self. It's a duly engaging in action. They, you know, they, they set an example and, and they kind of, there's an old saying, the mango tree, when it's ripe, the branches bend down so that it's easy to, yes. pick, easy to pick the fruit. You know, the, yes. It's not like the branches are way up there. So you, you know, it's not like you're speaking from some plateau on high. You're, yes. pro- you're providing something that meets people where they're at. Yeah, it's it's just been part of I guess what my mission is 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 to actually it doesn't feel like a personal mission. It's part of what I've been given to do is mm-hmm. is to continually dissolve these imaginary dualities that are that we find in our everyday experience, and also try, again back to the thing I said very early on be a bridge as opposed to just take a position and say if you don't agree with this position you just haven't gotten it yet Mm -hmm. that to me that's very uh, it's prideful and it's uh, and it causes people to to just uh, idolize you and think that they haven't gotten something Mm -hmm. as though it's actually something to get (laughs) and in my experience part of uh, I, I love this quote and I can't remember who I'm quoting. But the quote is, uh, the only dif- I think it's Nisargadatta or it's Sailor Bob, I can't remember. But the only di- I think it may be Sailor Bob. But anyway, the only difference between someone who's realized and someone who's not is the one who's realized knows there's no difference. Hmm. That's nice. Because th- wherever you're seeing differences, that's still the illusion. Mm. Any sense of differentiation is the illusion. Now, you need that in order to function in life. You can't pretend they're not there. But at the same time, if if you're creating this stratification, even subtly in the way you're presenting your message, then you've missed, I, from my perspective, you've missed the whole point. Yeah. I, uh, 
I'm a kind of a practice sort of guy myself. I've been meditating for a long time, and um, I there's a there's a another theme in non-dual circles of uh, rejecting practice because it it implies the, it implies the presence of a practicer, and it only reinforces the notion of a practicer, and so on and so forth. And so I had you know I have a bias in favor of it actually, and I, I admire someone like yourself who has a practical method that can be offered to people. Uh, rather than just words or concepts or sitting in one's pre- in the presence of the teacher, which isn't always po- pra- very practical. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it, you know, it, it's, it, we live in a world. Of, well, you can on YouTube. You can sit in their presence, but sorta, sorta. I, I mean, you don't get the vibe quite. To the same no, it's, not, it's not as strong. You're yeah, right. it's definitely not as strong. But the the I struggle with that when I was still kind of seeking in that. Certain teachers would say that, and yes, it's true for them. Mm-hmm. They no longer did a practice, but they, they neglect to say that they were doing practice. For 30 some years even, or something. Yeah, I know. Yeah, and so they even were doing practice when they, when they had their first experience of the truth of who they were. Mm-hmm. It was in the middle of a practice. Yep. So, uh, so, again, what I say is, yes, of course, the, it is an act of grace that the, the co- completion is completely an act of grace. But in the Buddhist circles, they say uh, you can, uh, what is it? The, I don't remember the exact quote, but basically all practice is designed to do, uh, oh, they call it an accident. Well, yeah, I know and what you're saying. It's, it's, um, and, but, the, but all practice is designed to do is make you accident pro. Exactly, right. Well, in my experience, the Sedona method is makes people more accident prone than one almost anything else I know of because it's dealing with the exact thing that prevents you from living the experience. The vasanas and samskaras. Or it's, the a, it's a room with a banana peel rug, right? Right, <laughs> right. The non-dual space is a room with a well. So, it's a, in other words, it's a it's a it's an accident waiting to happen. It makes accidents right, right, very right. likely. <laughs> no, but it's also. It's a room like this. The, the non-dual space, as long as there's any sense of separation, the room is slightly tilted, mm-hmm. and you can't maintain the experience because it's still right. just an experience. It may be a profound experience. So if, if you're, you've had profound experiences of non-duality, and you're wondering, well, why do I keep getting caught back up into the world? It's, it's only, it doesn't mean you did anything wrong. It doesn't mean that what you saw is invalid. It just means that the mind is not free of seeds yet, mm-hmm. free of tendencies, free of some scars. You need to cook the seeds. And if you don't cook the seeds, no matter how many profound experiences you have of non-duality, you're still going to find yourself getting sucked back into the illusion of the body-mind world as being real. Mm-hmm. And perhaps we could say that correspondingly that something hasn't changed in the nervous system, in the brain, to support that non-dual yes, experience. And I think, the two are correlated. And I think that you, that's also where practice comes in. Yeah. The, it's helping rewire the, mm-hmm. your energy, your, your um, pranic system and your nervous system right. so that it can actually maintain the non-dual state. Mm-hmm. Neuroplasticity. Is Neuroplasticity, that? yes. Yeah. Uh, and, and also just energetics. The the the, uh, the prana or the energy is required for the uh, for the mind to maintain that state. Mm-hmm. It, otherwise, it gets lost back into the world. So what happens is most people just go, "Hey, you know, you just need to listen to what I'm saying, or uh, or you know, just read my book or whatever, and you'll get it. And if you don't get it, it's just your problem." Yeah. Don't don't follow a teacher, but keep coming to my seminars. <laughs> yes. Keep, keep, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, we could. You know, I'm, there are Eastern traditions that have worked this out in great detail in terms of chakras and nadis and you know chi and prana and all that stuff. And you know, I'm not qualified to go there. And then I think West, certain Western neurophysiologists are trying to understand it in in their terms and with their instruments and there's a lot of research being done on brain activity during you know, non-dual states and meditative states and stuff so anyway that's a whole other topic but 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 it does emphasize the point that there's something going on in the physiology that correlates with this experience that we're all yes. talking interested in yes yes absolutely and and it's it's 
if we're really interested in non-duality, if we're really interested in ending suffering, then we need to deal with the whole package. Mm -hmm. we, we can't ignore the package or pretend the package isn't there and keep tripping over it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing because I, I've heard you refer to your birds, and I hear one of those birds in the yes, back. Yes, uh, uh, I'm in our home office, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the birds that are one landing up in my house. Yeah. I was interviewing this guy... Um, who used to be the bass player for the Mahavishnu Orchestra, um, and I and there's this noise that kept happening throughout the interview. I said, "Can you shut the door? There's some baby screaming in the other room." He said, "No, that's a bird." <laughs> <laughs> I'm Rick, sure Rick, right. Rick Laird is his name, by the way. If anybody wants to listen to that interview, um, so so how does the Sedona method? Might as well start getting into it. How? You know, you've presented it very nicely as not merely some feel-good thing or work through your problems thing, but as a viable method of, you know, attaining non-dual realization. So what are the mechanics through which it could do that? Well, uh, let me take a step back. The, the, I just want to make sure that everyone's listening is clear about what the process is itself. Yeah. Uh, it's basically... Uh, a form of inquiry uh, uh, that deals with uh, not just the I thought, but all, all the samskaras and vasanas, seeing that you aren't that, uh, but in a very practical, experiential way. So that's one way of describing. And another way of describing is just simply that uh, I, I like to use props for this. Mm -hmm. Let me just make sure this is closed so I don't write on myself. <laughs> <laughs> which I've known to do. Uh, so, uh, for the sake of this analogy, this pen represents our our some scars, our vasanas, our beliefs, our attitudes, our our anger, fear, frustration, everything that's in between us and experiencing non-duality, and also anything in between us and having our goals in life, uh, and our hand represents our gut or our awareness. So mm -hmm. uh, those of you watching at home, if you're uh, pick up an object so you can do this with me because it actually doing this sometimes it <laughs> thanks it's a magnifying <laughs> glass. Yeah. So be careful when I when in the next part when you drop it uh, catch it. <laughs> <laughs> those of you at home try to pick up something you'd be willing to drop without worrying about uh, catching it. Mm -hmm. So what we do in life is we don't we are generally, this is our relationship to every problem. We're going like this. So grip the object really tightly with your hand. I mean really tightly until it starts to feel really uncomfortable. Now, this is what it feels like inside most of the time for all of us. As long as we're identifying with that body-mind mechanism, as long as we're identifying with our suffering, we're gripping it at the same time. So now relax your hand and open the open it and roll the hand around on your object. Uh, around the object around your hand. Now is this object attached to your hand? Obviously not. But think about our relationship to everything that we don't like. We we actually feel as though it is us. It's even in our language. We don't usually say I feel sad. We say I'm sad. We don't usually say I feel angry. We say I'm angry. We don't usually say uh, 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 even the things this, in the non-dual space, we don't usually say, I'm feeling peaceful. We say, uh, I'm at peace, or actually that's still okay. There's still some sense of clarity there. But we think, I'm enlightened. That's right. a very common one. Mm -hmm. That's an identification. So, But remember, it's a all these identifications are attached to us as this hand is attached to your hand. So you have a choice. You can do this. Now turn your hand upside down and then just let go. Open. Just drop the object. Mm -hmm. So that is the choice that you can make any moment with anything that appears to be holding you back on any level. And that's one way we teach of letting go. Another way we teach of letting go is if you uh, if you live life open, this camera is too small, but if you live life open, 
things don't stick to you. So it's kind of like going through life with your hand open as opposed to closed. If you go through life with your hand open, then things pass through your experience naturally. Mm -hmm. They don't stick. So uh, we call that welcoming or allowing. Uh, they, in Zen, they call that they uh, they call it vipassana or mindfulness. Uh, but you can actually live life that way, where you're not clinging to what's what's being experienced in the moment. You're just allowing life to flow naturally, and that's. <coughs> That's another way of letting go. Another way of letting go is if you look at this object and you look at it from the outside, it looks uh, solid. But uh, if you uh, could magnify this enough, and this won't be enough, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but if you could magnify it enough, the object would start to see, seem less and less dense mm -hmm. because it's mostly empty space. Yeah. And so what happens is when the reason that our limitations appear real to us is because we're all living life on the surface. We don't realize, especially internally, we're living in a soap bubble. And you know how thin that is? Mm. The non-dual space is both inside the bubble and outside the bubble. So if you, what we tend to do, though, is we try to stay on the surface of the bubble and try to hold our whole life together. And, but if you simply dive into the bubble, it pops because it has no substance. So we call that diving in. Hmm. And then what you, in life, everything, as long as there's mind, there's pairs of opposites. You cannot have mind without it. If you have in, there's also out, up and down. There's certain useful ones for just functioning in life. But the mind has added layer upon layer upon layer upon layer of conflicting polarities or dualities, uh, and like right and wrong, and good and bad, and uh, have to and can't, and there's so many. And the mind also tries to keep them separate. We have a pile over here of all the good stuff, and a pile over here of all the stuff we think is bad, and we're doing this all the time. You know, I don't want to, I don't, you know, I, and it's a juggling act, you know, we're, we're kind of... <laughs> yeah. He's pretty flexible. <laughs> you must do yoga. <laughs> I do yoga, but I was born flexible. <laughs> but anyway, the, the, but what happens is, if you welcome both sides, mm -hmm. instead of, uh, again, people are willing to welcome peace, but if you also welcome disturbance, and peace, they dissolve each other because they're polarities, they're, con they're a continuum. So what we discovered is that if you are willing to welcome both that which you judge as good and that which you judge as bad, that which creates pleasure and that which creates pain, they, they simply start to merge and what's left over is non-duality. That's what's already here. So, so right in the life, when you're experiencing some conflict, all you need to do is say, well, what would be here if the conflict was already resolved? And so you welcome that, and you welcome the conflict. A lot of times we'll go there and we'll try to substitute. Uh, well, I'm just going to think about the positive and pretend <laughs> the negative is going to go away. Yeah, well, that works not at all. <laughs> That's the biggest problem with positive thinking is you're just, it, you're, you're just layering, uh, uh, you're putting a happy face on top of your problem. And the problem doesn't go away because of that. But if you welcome the problem and the solution, both, they dissolve each other and you, you do what Einstein says, you can, you're moved to a new level to solve the problem from, which is not the same level you created it at. Right. And so that, we call that holistic release. Hmm. And then, the, sorry, go ahead. Okay. Well, I could interject some comments, anytime, or you could continue if you'd like. Uh, anytime you want to. I, again, I really don't have a train of thought. Okay. Cause, because the, I don't think about what I'm going to say before I think it. Right. It can happen. Kind of like Ronald Reagan. <laughs> we not quite like that. We not. Sometimes people would call me that like that too. 
I saw a cartoon that depicted the Reagan end run. It had some thought kind of going around the back of his brain and skipping the frontal cortex and <laughs> coming out of his mouth. <laughs> but um, a few comments. Uh, one is that did you find, did you have you heard? This is very interesting. That you're talking about the insubstantiality of the physical. You know, if you took all seven billion people in the world and removed all the empty space that's actually between all the subatomic particles in their bodies and whatnot, you'd end up with an object the size of a grain of rice. I didn't hear that. That's cool. Yeah. And, and even that object, if you go deeper, is just sort of strings and probabilities and, you know, it's, it's, it's virtual uh, ultimately. And uh, I forget what else I was going to say, but it doesn't matter. I've probably said it before. But one question I have with regard to letting go of the pen Yes. Um, I get the sense, and, I, and in listening to you do your thing, it's obvious that you don't let go of everything in one go. I mean, no. it, t it takes a while. It, it took you know decades and lifetimes to build it all up layer by layer. It's going to take a while to work yes. back through the layers. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So let me uh, finish the last, the fifth way of letting go, and then sure. I'll tell you how they all interrelate. Okay. The fifth way of letting go is where we meet the non-dual space. Is we call it the fifth way, and I've, the, it, it's just basically <clears throat> active inquiry, and that is noticing that non-duality that's here and now, that's already whole and complete, mm -hmm. and also noticing that that sense of me is not there. You can't find it. So the every one of the, the things, the other ways of letting go, involve varying degrees in believing that there's someone there to let go. Mm -hmm. And so what, I, what we do in our seminars, but what I also help people learn how to do is you go back and forth. You deal with the layer you're at. Now, mm -hmm. if there's an obvious polarity, you welcome the polarity, and then there's nothing. If you're, if you're just clinging to something, you let go. If you are, uh, if you find you're you're just repelling and you're not really letting yourself feel, you dive in. So whatever is appropriate in the moment. But you also, Leslie used to say, you need to balance ego elimination with non-duality, with being that which you are through mm -hmm. study of scripture or or hanging out with a, a, a truly realized teacher or or just loving yourself or just being that non-dual space. So you, you go back and forth. If you just do one, you can get into a, a, a completely artificial state of, of joyous escape. If you're just focusing on that non-dual space, you can actually live life uh, especially if you live in a beautiful place and you have don't have a job and and everything everybody in your life is always nice to you and all this other kind of stuff, you can spend periods where you're you think you're in this pure non dual space, but it's just an escape. And on the other hand, uh, you can get and I've seen this too. People get so obsessed with getting rid of the vasanas and some scars, the, the the tendencies and desires. They get so lost in that that they forget the non dual space, and they start mm. reinvent. They start, uh, they start doing this. You're in a boat that's sinking. Here's here's the boat. It's sinking. Uh, except it's. I, I don't know how I'm going to do this. But with one hand you're, you, with one hand you're bailing, and the other hand you're refilling the boat. So we're going like this into our boat. We're bailing with one hand, and we're refilling it with the other hand. Huh. So what you need to do is this. <laughs> you yeah. need to be letting go with both hands. Hmm. But uh, so I, I always encourage people to balance any sense of working on the illusion of me with just resting as that which they already are. Hmm. Another thing which is more rare, but um, which I sometimes get feedback from people. This this one came in from a young woman um, over in Europe. She said that she, uh, when I was 18, I fell into the non-dual state for four hours and my kundalini awoke. And at the age of 23, one year ago, I went into the state of samadhi, uh, self-realization, which was such an enormous shift that I became dysfunctional, and I still am. My identity disappeared into consciousness like becoming a baby. Uh, it was scary, not knowing how to survive physically, um, and she goes on and on. But people sh can shift into a state so radically that they 
don't know how to think, don't know how to talk. You know, I mean, Byron Katie was an example, and Eckhart Tolle both. They, they, their shift was so sudden and abrupt and unanticipated right. that right. it took took them years to learn how to function again. Right, and that's that's not uncommon. Mm. Uh, when uh, when there's that radical shift, without without uh, without two things, without all the without good process to support it. In other mm. words. Uh, knowing how to deal with w- the world, both on a purely practical level, but also on a the uh, physical, emotional, energetic level, mm-hmm. uh, uh, and uh, see, so, so it doesn't invalidate that non-dual experience that that they're having, but it does make it really difficult to function in life. Mm-hmm. And so, and, and oh, and the other thing is just simply lifestyle. You need to create a lifestyle. That supports non-duality. In other words, what kind of lifestyle would that be? Well, uh, more, I guess, more of a sattvic lifestyle, mm-hmm. uh, and, and certainly not a tamasic lifestyle. But again, simple things like I, I'm going to people are going to hate this, but things like uh, uh, sex, drugs, and rock and roll uh-huh. to, it, to excess is not exactly conducive. Right. <laughs> but a little Hendrix every now and then. Yeah, yeah. a little Hendrix now and then. That's <laughs> you know what I mean. Uh, or uh, uh, just being absolutely obsessed with success, for instance. Right. Is, is great if you want success. But being absolutely obsessed with success and wondering why you can't meditate deeply or you can't experience non-duality, it's really obvious because there's much more of that anger uh, anger, pride, courageousness than there is acceptance and peace. Mm-hmm. So, the yeah, the Gita addresses that stuff too. It says, you know, this yoga is not for him who sleeps too much or too little, who eats too much or too little, who, you know, who, who just you, you kind of and the Buddha, I guess, the the middle way, advocating balance. You know, you just don't go overboard in any one direction because, again, back to the physiology, you know, we've got an instrument that we need to to maintain if we want to live this non-dual thing, and you can damage that influ- instrument through yes. any, any number of means. Right, right, and, yeah. and it will just distract you. So you can you can have these amazing non-dual experiences, but if you don't have practice to support it, mm-hmm. on some level, some, some sort of practice that just helps you ground it and support it, and you also aren't creating a lifestyle that supports it, it's really hard to maintain. Mm. Yeah. Um, I've been having a discussion with a friend of mine named Jerry uh, about a lot of this stuff because um, we keep coming across people who, again, have some sort of awakening, maybe a very profound one, uh, but they, they're kind of in a stage of you know nothing ever happens, nothing to talk about, nothing to think about, nothing to do. And uh, Jerry's emphasis is that that's kind of maybe a preliminary stage, but eventually what the what the Hindus call Brahman is considered to be the they say the eater of everything. It's all inclusive, so it includes yes. it includes all the nitty gritty of life, all the granularity, you know, all the structure, the processes, the yes. subjective character of one's life, everything. So you know, non dual is is not just this kind of um, plain vanilla nothingness. It's it's the whole the full catastrophe to quote Zorba. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah. As from Zorba the Greek, you know, complete, right. completely engulfed though in wholeness, rather than in, in all fra- in fr- a million fragments as yes. it once Again, was. Uh, you, you, this is a classic quote: Before mm-hmm. enlightenment, you chop, chop wood, wood carry, carry water. water. After enlightenment, you chop wood, uh, wood and carry water. But so many people out there right now are, are in the middle state, mm-hmm. where they're in this new place that is is almost becomes a way to avoid life. Yeah, water is an illusion, wood is an illusion. Yeah, water is an illusion, wood is an illusion. <laughs> there's no one to chop, there's no one to carry. Yeah, uh, right. And and that's not, uh, that's why most of those people eventually kind of fall back. Either they get very sick or because they're not tending the instrument or they kind of fall out of the state and don't know what happened. Mm-hmm. Because it's, it's, there's, that's part of why in the East they have teachers and they emphasize that you need to have in order to really approach non-duality you need to have at least some touchstone now if you have have a good enough inner instrument 
that you can you can actually get knowledge directly from the source, that's great. But that's not common. Most people need some in external support, not a dependent relationship, but external support, so that they uh, they can t they know that this is just a stage, for instance. Right. I mean, so many people are out there uh, are are in just a stage, and there are many stages, and they think, oh, now I've got it. Oh, now I've got it. Now, now I've got it. Now, who is this guy who got it? Now, obviously, <laughs> nobody. Yeah. But, but they still think that on a very subtle level, even though they in their in their what they're presenting to in life, they may not even talk about it. But that's actually what they're experiencing. That you, something has been accomplished. Do you know who Adyashanti is? Of course. Yeah, here's one from him. Um, even now with me, the mystery is just beginning, always still beginning. Yes. And, you know, he's a guy that I would respect as being quite ripe, you know, quite, quite far along. But, and uh, I've, I've used these quotes many times, but here's one from St. Teresa of Avila. She said, the feeling remains that God is on the journey too. In, in other words, if you God himself, you, this is just a stage. There's yes. more unfoldment. Yeah, and, and, and I... I a hundred percent agree with that. Again, if it gets static, then then you're you're like this against the wall. Now, it may be a beautiful wall. It may be this beautiful, apparently non-dual wall, but you're still like this, and you're missing everything else. So, why do you think it is that people have a tendency to feel that they have arrived and there's nothing more to unfold? That, you know, that they, you know, uh, it's two. Th it's two things. It's it's the minds wanting it was well, more than two I'll just start speaking <laughs> I said two and then I can see more than two right. but the the first thing is the mind is always looking to create a structure around whatever is experienced mm. based on comparing it to the past based on comparing it to what we've learned and so and as long as there's any sense of a me not even and also there's levels of this too the in the East, they call it asmita, mm -hmm. or uh, or ahankara. Uh, but a lot of times, ahankara or the sense of the eye, eye sense, the eye sense may have mostly disappeared for someone, but the sense of amnes is still there. Mm. That's still an illusion. Mm -hmm. And so, a lot of people get to this amnes, and they mm. think that's it. Uh -huh. That's just the beginning. So that's one reason. And beneath that would be isness. Right. Yeah. And, and beneath that is no longer words. Mm. Right. Even isness is still within a framework. Yeah. So, and that's kind of the difficulty. Difficulty here is, is, is non duality. Uh, uh, one of the things that Ramana did, one of his main ways of teaching, was to say nothing at all. Right. And people said he wouldn't talk. That's not true. He he would talk, but the, he always talked about silence is the highest teaching. And one of the things that I always loved about Lester, my my mentor, is that he always said the same thing. He said that the highest teachings are the silent teachings because if you're using words, it's already a representation, and it doesn't matter how good the words are, they're still lies. They're still conceptual. So. So the people will confuse this sense of amnes with the sense uh, with when there's a much less sense of I am, but there's still sense of, of amnes. They'll think they're done. Hmm. Uh, and and the other thing that will happen is they'll they'll have some of the symptoms of uh, that they've heard from other people. And they think since they have those symptoms, maybe this is it. But it's, if you're if you're looking for a this it experience, that's not it. <laughs> so uh, when people have awakening type experiences in my seminar, I say that's nice. And then and so and then we just continue. It's it's we absolutely make nothing out of it because it is nothing. I mean, it the if you make. And you make it significant, meaningful, important, or anything like that, you, you immediately are putting it back in a box. Mm. 
you're immediately putting all this artificial sense of definition around something that defies definition. So, uh, you, you, it, when Adya Shanti first had his first major awakening, he actually heard a voice that said, "Keep going." <laughs> that's great. And again, yeah. he's a, he's one of those people that has a nice access to that to the direct teaching mm -hmm. uh, that comes through often without words, but sometimes with words, but it's not from a, an embodied teacher. Maybe a disembodied teacher, but it's not from an embodied teacher. Hmm. One th uh, impression that I got over and over again as I was listening to your talks is that what the Sedona Method, if I, if I had to sum up the Sedona Method and see how, if you agree with this, I would say that it's, it's a way of learning to cooperate with nature's intelligence. Yes. Um, you know, we kind of get in the way of what nature is able to accomplish much more effectively than we possibly could. And it's a, it's a method of kind of allowing yourself to get out of the way and let, yes. na let nature do its thing. Yeah, I, 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 I would totally agree with that. There's most, uh, uh, another wonderful analogy that you've probably heard before is life is kind of like a river. Right. And, and, but, how most of us experience life is we're we're actually swimming against the current, mm -hmm. gripping one rock from another, trying to pull ourselves out of the flow. <laughs> and when you, the more you let go, the more you just become the river, flowing around whatever appears to be an obstacle, and and you're always flowing towards the the ocean, and river and ocean are the same uh, and another analogy of course is like the waves in the ocean the, again in life we, we identify often with the wave and we forget that both the wave and the ocean are just water mm -hmm. and in what the method does is it helps you notice your oceanness even when the wave is like <laughs> And it helps, if you've really gotten lost in this, it helps you kind of step back and do whatever process is appropriate in the moment to, to, to relax again as the ocean. Mm. Helps the wave to settle down. Kind helps of. the wa wave to settle down. Mm. It's so funny, in life, most of the time, we're, we're, the waves, we're, we try to outdo every other wave. <laughs> but we forget that all the waves are going to end up at the shore. And what happens to the waves when they end up at the shore? They're they gone. poof. Yeah, they're gone. So we're in a hurry to get to the, to our dissolution without even realizing it. Hmm. <laughs> he who dies with the most toys wins. Yeah. People. Yeah. Another thought that uh, impression that kept coming to mind as I was listening to you was that. You know, speaking again of nature's intelligence, it seems that you know that it's natural. I mean, that as individual human beings, we embody certain tendencies that are present universally in nature. And yes. one of one of those tendencies is is it is natural for the universe to individuate. Yes. Um, you know, the after the Big Bang, I guess we had this big amorphous field of something, uh, and then it, it sort of accreted into stars eventually you know right. there was an individuation and then the stars exploded and then even more diversification and individuation right. took place and that, you know, now we have people and salamanders and all kinds of specific things um, and yet at the very same time it's and so that that would account for the getting lost in the in the minutia of life getting getting overshadowed getting gripped aspect but then at the very same time it's natural for the reverse flow to take place to get back to universality and so it's almost like the universe is on a grand scale is playing this game of specificity back to universality and we as individual units are you know experiencing the same thing in our own lives that definitely We're, and again what we do though is we resist the process right uh, you, you well, that's the in, perhaps that's the individuation tendency. Yes, still tendency. still holding on well, and not we realizing. Wanna, we want to yeah. we want to take our individuality into non-duality. Uh huh. Yeah. And you can't do that. Right. It doesn't want to surrender. Itself, right. But. The 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 freedom or non-duality or or awakening, whatever you want to call it. I I have yet to hear a word that I that's really accurate. Mm -hmm. Is from you. It's not for you. Say, elaborate on that. Well, 
the to the degree that there's no sense of a separate me, to that degree the non-duality, which is already here, is 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 shining in plain view. Mm-hmm. The so, but what we do on this on the path is we generally we're trying to take me with us, mm-hmm. so that we I can have an experience of oneness. I can have an awakening. And as soon as you say my awakening, mm. now let's say you're the, the most hand, okay. If, go if ahead. If you just avoid your, if you censor your language and say there was an awakening, that's still the same thing. <laughs> 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 so you change your language. That's another thing I tell people: is you uh, you should use in relating to people. If you're using any kind of language that wouldn't be understood by the checkout person right. at the supermarket. Then, then there's a distortion. I tell people, please don't, um, don't try to take the language that we're using here. Sometimes we have to use this kind of distorted language in a seminar to help you experience what's beyond what we usually experience. But don't try to t- talk to your friends that way. No, in our supermarket, every time you check out, they're they're trained to say, "Did you find everything okay?" I mean, <laughs> and there's all kinds of things I could do with right, that. Right. You know, <laughs> well, what, you know, I wasn't actually looking for everything, and really, there is there is no I, and yeah, you know, you go right, on right, up. Right, 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 right. <laughs> um, go ahead. I, I had a thought, but I lost it. But oh, well, actually, I had a thought that I want to share. Is that it's a tan- it's tangential, but the other thing is that there's an, an the movie analogy is a great analogy oh, yeah. to explain what we're experiencing. And again, it's, remember, it's just an analogy. The, the, again, people hear these analogies and then they try to make literal sense out of the whole thing, or they think that's the truth. Oh, I mean, the ocean. Well, not really. Right. But it's just a teaching story. But and, every, and every analogy has its limitations. So, it totally yeah. limitations. But right. the the... The anal- one of the analogy that I like in explaining that is that, first off, when you go to a movie, a regular movie, you don't enjoy the movie unless you identify with at least one character. Mm-hmm. If you don't identify with the character, there's no drama. Mm-hmm. I saw a movie last night, Epic. It's a kids flick, so I usually like kids kids flicks, but this one, it wasn't didn't quite make that. You didn't really buy it a hundred percent. So it was even though it was beautiful to watch. And uh, there were great special effects, and it was a really good animation job. It wasn't Avatar, Mm -hmm. where you really identified with the characters and you really identified with the story. And so this movie that we're experiencing now is the same way. This movie, in order for it to have high entertainment value, you identify with one of the characters. Mm. And you also think that all the other characters are separate. And, but it's it's just a movie. Hmm. So, uh, and you've probably heard the uh, it, it, uh, taking that analogy a little further. You've probably heard the movie analogy where you're just the screen, right? Which is accurate. You're just the screen, and but what you also forget is you're also the light. And the film in between is the samskaras and vasanas. What you're experiencing in life is an outpicturing of all your past tendencies. You're experiencing the past all the time. You're not actually experiencing what's here. But if you went to a movie and all you had was the screen and the light with no film, it would be, you, you know, everybody would walk out, right? There'd be no uh, entertainment. Yes, that, that, <laughs> absolutely. A- absolutely. So that's part of the reason that we have this whole dance is because it has it's the way we stay engaged it has entertainment value it has entertain it has a high entertainment value Leela uh, yes Leela exactly mm-hmm. and that's also they in the in the East they talk about the uh, the Maya the Leela or Maya disappears for the one who's seen the truth but it, it stays there for everybody else well that Again, because it's just a theory or an analogy, it breaks down. And it's really not important. The important thing is that you are both the light and the screen. And the reason that sometimes there are all these things in your experience that that you're getting lost in is one is because you're identifying 
with the projection on the screen. And you don't notice that when there's an explosion in the, in the movie, you don't burn. Or when there's a flood, you don't get wet. That's one level. But the other level is that's all made up of the pictures are all made up of your tendencies, your some scars, your, 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 your desires. So if you need to deal with that, if you, if you just try to pretend you're the screen or pretend you're the light, or maybe you even notice that you're the light in the screen and you're not dealing with all the stuff in between, it, it still stays cloudy. And you still can forget. It's easy to forget. But if you deal with the samskaras and vasanas, if you dissolve them, then you, it's harder and harder to forget. Yeah. You said a little while ago, um, we'll come back to de- more to dealing with the samskaras and vasanas, but you said a little while ago that uh, you know one is in the non-dual experience to the extent that uh, a hamkara or ego has, has diminished or dissolved. Right. But, but, I mean, even if you were the most non-dual guy on the planet, um, and maybe you are, I don't know, but, <laughs> but uh, w- wouldn't there have to be some, uh, in Sanskrit there is this term, lesha vidya, faint remains of ignorance. Uh, it's my understanding there would have to be some faint remains at least in order for it, you to be functional. Um, yeah. you know, otherwise, you're just going to lie down and starve to death or something. Or, or, or your devotees will feed you. Yeah, yeah, which are, in the case of Ananda Maimar, Maimar Neem Karoli Baba, and they, they seem to be in that condition practically. Yes, yes. so there, there are people in that condition. But yes, there are still, uh, what dissolves is your identification. But right. you're still, the package of, of the core samskaras and vasanas that, that make up your, they, in the East they call it the prabdha, I can't pronounce Par- Parabdha that. karma. Parabdha karma. The, the karmas from before can be dissolved, and the future mm-hmm. karmas can be dissolved. Mm-hmm. But the karma you're actually living out, mm. that you'll doesn't live, dissolve. You'll live it out, yeah. Huh. But you can do so realizing clearly that you are that all the world's a stage and all the men and women nearly merely players. You know, exactly. You're just a player in this, and that you're not really getting stabbed or burned or whatever. Whatever it is. Yeah. It's, and at the same time, you don't you take care of the body. I mean, if someone's about to stab you, you, can, you don't just go, "Okay, stab." <laughs> yeah, it's only an illusion, anyway. <laughs> right. <laughs> you step out of the way. <laughs> you take the appropriate action. <laughs> mm-hmm. Now, um, one thing that I kept thinking of, and this shifts gears a little bit, uh, as I was listening to the thing, is, okay, what if Hale was sent to Connecticut to console and deal with the Sandy Hook parents, you know, sent, sent to New, Newtown? I mean, you're not just going to say, you know, a few days after that tragedy, you know, can you just let it go? I mean, oh, no, I might. You might, but, I mean, I might, but obviously the grief is very sharp at that point. But, it, but the first step is to allow it. Mm-hmm. The, what happens is people very often, uh, the grieving process gets very extended hmm. because people aren't allowing themselves to feel what they're feeling in the moment. They try to numb out. Yeah. They numb out. They'll, they'll either suppress mm-hmm. or they'll escape or they'll express the emotion, but they won't just 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 be with it. So, and again, a lot of therapy is based on expressing which is better often and a necessary step. But there's a balancing point in the middle of all those three, the, the suppression, the escape, or the expression. The balancing point right at the center is just an allowing. So when I work with people who have, are dealing with severe trauma, what you do is you start by just allowing for their experience. And and know that they're and let people know that their experience is okay. You're not supposed to be experiencing anything different than what you are. It's a natural experience. And then from so the you way, wouldn't dream of saying to them, "Oh, it's just an illusion," and and this, you know, the, the, no, your, no, your no, children no. are not really dead. They weren't really. Yes, they, they didn't really exist to begin anyway, with. And, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, that's that would be really insensitive. Get yourself punched in the nose or something. Well, of course. Yeah. Shot. <laughs> I have a gun too. <laughs> right. But uh, no, what you do is you you deal with where people are at in the moment. So the the movie has that triple welcoming process in it. That's a very good situation like that. So the first thing you do is you welcome what's being experienced. The 
thoughts, the feelings, the beliefs, the sadness, the memories, all of it. And then what you do is you welcome the all you're wanting to fix it, to change it, to control it, to and also wanting to pretend it didn't happen. All the things we usually try to do with anything that we've labeled as unpleasant. So you welcome that too. And just in welcoming those two things is already relief. First, in welcoming what you're experiencing, there's relief. Because you're usually fighting with it or thinking you should be over it. Or, or, or there's so many beliefs about what's correct. So that's one level. So if you welcome what you're experiencing, there's already some relief. Then if you welcome what... Uh, all what you're you're trying to modify your experience or fix or change it, there's a tremendous relief in that. And then what you do is you also welcome the sense that it's your experience. You don't deny that. <clears throat> so any sense that it's me, it's about me, or it's who I am, you welcome that. Now people often will say when I say we're well, welcome, well yeah, it feels like I said yeah, it does. But you just welcome that it feels like you, that, that there's this identification. Now, do people have adequate capacity to welcome the most severe things, or, or is it that you just, you, you know, nature guiding this process, you're given as much as you can handle to welcome yes. at, at any given time? Yes, I don't say, uh, it, welcoming is not forcing yourself to bring it all up. Right, because you might be like just a little yeah. cup of water which can't take a shovel full of dirt, whereas an ocean could. Right, exactly. So right. when you're welcoming, you're welcoming only what you're experiencing in the moment. Okay. Uh, and just in doing that, it gets less overwhelming, not more. Because the thing itself dissolves or because your capacity grows or both? Both. Okay. Yeah. So in a situation like that, that would be one of the tools I would use because mm -hmm. I've, there was a man on my uh, last retreat. I, I, he... He was the first person to work on the retreat, and what he worked on is that he was severely abused. Uh, he was abused by his priest when he was a kid, mm -hmm. uh, and then what happened is he he told his dad about it. He told his family, and his dad beat him for 15 years Whoa. because he didn't believe him. Yikes! So he had two layers. He had the yeah. abuse, and then he had the. Uh, the sexual abuse, and then he had the abuse of his his dad because his dad just couldn't accept that the priest would do something like that. So it must have been a story he made up, and he got punished for it for 15 years. Mm. So you might that might bring up just a little bit of trauma. Yeah, really. So we did just this triple welcoming process, and he was the very first person to work. And in just 10 minutes, the the core of it dissolved and didn't resurface or reemerge. Yeah. There were there were of layers that came after that, but they were less and less mm -hmm. after that. And by the end of the retreat, his relationship with his wife had healed, and a whole other. That's part of the reason that you knew he had a genuine letting go is that there were all these co compensations and results from holding on to this trauma that all started to dissolve out of his life. I think he was sleeping better. He went through a whole litany of things mm -hmm. that had changed, and and so. Even with severe things like that, if you're willing to start with where you're at right now and you're willing to engage in the process, I've seen people do really miraculous things. I mean, really miraculous things. Nice. Um, one thing I admired or appreciated in listening to your interview with Terry Patton was that you were very a kind of ecumenical or eclectic. You just sort of, you know, saw the Sedona method as one of many, many tools in the world that people can use to evolve and grow and uh, there was no sort of our way is the best way or <laughs> 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 kind of thing. Well, I, don't, I don't even think that. I yeah. think our way is a way Yeah. and you, and it may be the best way for you this moment mm -hmm. and then a, a year from now it may no longer be the best way for you. Yeah, that's uh, great. Th and, and I think that people need to really follow their hearts when it comes to, to any kind of tool or any kind of teacher. Mm -hmm. if, you're, if, you're, if you put the tool or the teacher first, then you're missing the point. Right. The, 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 what you always need to put first is, is this really supporting me? And, and, and with a teacher, is, is this teacher really, am I feeling that peace of of uh, and that love and that beingness that I am 
when I'm around them. If I'm not feeling that, or if I only feel it around them, and then every time I'm not around them, I, I'm, they're, they're just good at producing that state in their presence. But that, that state should not just be when you're with them. It should be more and more of the time. Right. If that's not happening, or if there's a, uh, how do you describe this? If there's, this is oh, Leela. This is hey. the this is the wayward cat that <laughs> had, had to go catch. The one that was in the gar in the right. garage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for the interruption, but I thought you might like to meet her. No, no, that's great. That's great. <laughs> So I'm saying. So you were saying about being around teachers all. The, yeah. If you lose the state when you're not with the teacher, then that, again, there are many teachers who have a very good. Um, they have a city. Right. Basically, to they can produce. evoke a, a, a state in you. Yeah. And yeah. And so the other thing is how they treat you. Right. If they treat you as a complete equal, mm -hmm. then you know you're in the right place. Mm. If they're either putting you up, oh, you're only the chosen few can be here. Where they're putting you down, someday you'll be as high as I am. Mm. Then you have to be cautious. Mm. The true teachers see you as the same as them. That's part of what makes them such a powerful teacher. So, which is not to say that some people aren't more spiritually evolved than others. No, no, but no, no, no. Of course, you know, it's, obviously, it's a yeah. It's a, it's obviously a, it's a continuum. The and. Uh, and especially teachers from the East are going to have at least some trapping. They just can't help it. It's sure. part of what the culture. Do. Part of the culture. It's more. To, it's more thing to be more concerned about in the West, mm -hmm. because it's not part of our culture. So if it's not part of our culture, there's something artificial there. Even if it's as simple as that, they're always sitting up here, and you're always sitting down here. Mm. Then that it's not required. Well, sometimes I mean, that's necessary if you're speaking I mean, to 300 not, not people. So you, you know, you, no, yeah, no, yeah. I'm not talking about that. I mean, in a small oh, room. Oh, I see. In, in a small room. In a big room, you have to have a stage. Right. It's <laughs> just, especially I do, honestly, I'm only 5'6". So <laughs> when I stand in front of a room, then mm -hmm. they start complaining because they can't see me. So I right. have to step up a step or two so, mm -hmm. so that they can actually at least see my face because <laughs> I'm short. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm not talking about that. There's there's a difference if there's the if there's a a, a separating happening right a hierarchy yeah a hierarchy then you know there's something going on mm -hmm. but also with any kind of tool the tools you should have a whole tool chest right and and you should use the tool that's appropriate for the moment now some tools are more universal and some tools are less universal but you still don't want to use a hammer. To, to screw to to change a light bulb, yeah, that would just create a mess. But a lot of people do. They think, well, this is the best tool, so I have to use it for every job. Well, it was only good, the best tool when it's the right tool. Yeah, I, I have a friend whom I'm sure you know who became a TM teacher in Rishikesh in the 1960s, and and um, she's also a Sedona teacher. And you know, I was talking to her about it. And she said, "Yeah, well, meditation is wonderful. I've been doing it all these years. I love it. It's very powerful and effective. But there are certain things, you know, which I found that Sedona really gets to, which meditation doesn't seem to have been getting to. Right. And uh, you know, so it's part of her toolbox. And yes, yeah, absolutely. And again, and in my experience, meditation combined with with releasing is amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, you don't again." Follow what is actually helping you. Right. If it's not helping you, don't keep doing it just because you're you think you're earning merit. Or Interesting. someday yeah. it's going to work. Yeah, somebody asked Maharishi one time how many followers he he had and he said, I don't have any followers. Everyone follows their own benefits. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um so tell us a bit about your teacher, since we're speaking of teachers. I know you um you know had a very Warm relationship with him for many years, and he was an amazing man. Uh, tell it might be interesting to hear Lester's story. Oh, sure. I I, I met Lester Levinson, uh, the man who inspired this work, back in 1976 at a at a seminar that I helped to organize for another uh, um, another thing. Another thing. I one of the things this lifetime I've always when I liked something, 
I just did it a thousand percent. Mm -hmm. I didn't just taste it. Uh, I did S years ago before I did the Sedona method, and within a weeks I was assisting at trainings, then I was a, a training supervisor, leading guest seminars. I was just gaga over it. And then all of a sudden I started to see that that was just brainwashing and programming, and I got the hell out of there. <laughs> but but uh, I had a, my way of doing it was to immerse myself. Uh -huh. So I was immersed in this other thing, and Lester came as a guest of the seminar leader, and he didn't, uh, it was a, a seminar that went over a year, and people came and went, so I didn't even really notice him that much in the seminar. But the seminar leader, myself, and the other organizer went out to lunch with Lester, and I was blown away. He was the first teacher I had met that was, I, I've, I've been very fortunate to meet many others since then, but he was the first one I had met who was no longer seeking. Hmm. Why was he at a seminar if he was no longer seeking? Uh, he was invited there because the man, he didn't come to the seminar to take the seminar. He came oh. to the seminar because the man was trying to decide whether or not to introduce Lester uh, to, the, to the, his following. Mm -hmm. And Lester was trying to decide whether or not this guy was even worth it to have anything to do with. I see. <laughs> so there was, that was one of those type of things. It was mm -hmm. like, all right, I'll come see what you're doing. Right, uh, and not because I need something, but because I, uh, he was a guest, just so that the seminar leader, uh, he he could experience with the seminar leader. Sure. Was and one of the what was it about Lester that made you realize that he wasn't seeking? While well, you're just having lunch with him. Uh, one is, I could feel his equanimity, the, mm -hmm. the changelessness. Two is there was a profound peace, and a, and on some level there was also a sense of of uh, blissfulness. Uh, and then there was, uh, uh, he wasn't doing that I'm up here thing. He was just an ordinary guy. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there was just this just inner knowingness that happened in meeting him. There was like, oh, this guy really knows what he's talking about. I need to find out what this is about. And I signed up for the seminar that the, the, the Sedona method back then was taught over a two weekend seminar. And uh, I immediately called the next day and signed up for it and then invited uh, a friend of mine to come with me because I was a little nervous. So I invited a, uh, a female friend of mine who was involved in the same group, one of the organizer types. And I said, will you come with me to this? I think you'll like it. And I'll even pay for it because she didn't have the money. And what happened during the seminars, I, I realized that, I inwardly realized that this is what I came here to be involved in. I just knew it then, and I've been involved in it ever since. But what, when I met Lester, uh, there was first who he was, but then there was his story. And his story was really very interesting. His story was that back in 1952, he was sent home to die from a second coroner. She wants to come back in. <laughs> yeah. The, you, you can just keep talking. You'll see me doing that. <laughs> Let the dogs okay. in and out. No, that's okay. <laughs> oh, you have dogs too? Dogs and cats. Yeah. And dogs and cats. So you're, you're the, you're the, the door you mod. Menagerie, yeah. yeah. But anyway, anyway so... Uh, uh, at he age, was sent back to die age, after a second the, coronary, yeah. The doctors basically gave him a death sentence, and he was very successful. He was living on a penthouse apartment on Central Park South in Manhattan mm -hmm. and, and even back then that was, a, that was an accomplishment right. uh, so he was, he was financially successful and he had at least two women who had proposed to him <laughs> it didn't happen that often back then so he had, he had external love directed towards him he had all the trappings of someone who should have been happy uh, from a worldly perspective except he was a physical and emotional basket case he had Post perforated ulcers and diverticulitis and jordanus several times a year and migraine headaches and depression and he was just a mess mm -hmm. and he also had gone to the therapy he went to a, uh, an associate of Freud who after four years said to him Wester I'm sorry but some people just can't be helped <laughs> <laughs> which if they said that today it would be a lawsuit but <laughs> <laughs> so he basically was a physical and emotional bath case, but he was a physicist engineer. So when he got this death sentence, first he went back to his library and he had studied psychology, medicine, engineering, chemistry. He studied all the fields of man except 
uh, metaphysics and spirituality because he thought if he couldn't prove it physically, it wasn't real, it wasn't true. So he went back to his library, and after a couple of, he thought maybe he could find the answer to get himself out of this mess. And after about two days, he just, or three days, he felt worse. And he dropped whatever book he was reading and said, Lester, for a smart man, you are stupid, stupid, stupid. So then he decided to go back to the web within himself. And that was a very fortunate decision. And he realized that if the knowledge was in books, for him, he would have already found it. So it wasn't in any of his pre-learned knowledge. And he asked himself, well, what have I been looking for? And he realized, you know, I've been looking for happiness. And so he said, well, what is happiness? And he started exploring what is happiness. And the first thing he saw, the first insight he had, was that happiness was, he first thought, well, happiness is when people, when I'm loved. And then he went, well, no, that's not it. I can remember times where I was loved and I still wasn't happy. So he said, well, maybe it's when I'm loving. And then when he saw that it was, one of the keys to happiness was when he was loving, he started going back to his life and wherever he was wanting love or, or not feeling love, he started changing it to love. Mm. And he started feeling better and better and better. And then he also start, saw that he, he wanted to change everything in his life. And even the ends of movies. <laughs> and how, how things had turned out. And so he started dissolving the wanting to change it. And then he went deeper and he saw that uh, there was this fear of death. And instead of running from it, he just turned around and faced it. Hmm. Uh, and after that process of kind of facing these things about himself, he entered this, this state of uh, uh, what he said was unbearable bliss. It, it was. It was so. It's, it's cool that he had the volition to be able to do all that. You know, a lot of people are more great. Right. You know, but he, yeah. he seems like he was able to just turn on a dime everywhere he tried. Well, I, I'm sure there was a process involved. Remember, I'm, mm. I, I, by the time I met him, it was. Uh, let's see, 1976. This happened in '52. Twenty. Oh, a long time, yeah. Twenty-seven years later, so right. by then the story had gotten distilled. Yeah. So I have no idea how, how much of it is a hundred percent accurate, because any story like this gets distilled. But you made so, enough progress in a short enough period of time that he didn't die in two weeks, obviously. <laughs> right, obviously. So what happened is, uh, he, he, when he was in this bliss state, he said, "There's got to be something beyond this," hmm. and he then he then kind of noticed he kind of stepped out of duality into non-duality. That's how he described it. Or, and then there was just peace, and he that that's what was left with him for 42 years, mm. just the sense of peace, no matter what was going on around him. And I saw him in intense situations, and that doesn't mean he didn't have still have emotion. Like I, I saw him angry, but it would just dissolve as soon mm. as it was no longer needed for communication. Oh, you know what? That reminds me of an analogy I wanted to throw in earlier, and I forgot what it was. It'll, I think it, you might find it interesting, and you may have heard it, which is that this, and we'll get back to Lester, but this, uh, it's from the Eastern wisdom again. It, it's said that someone who is very kind of um, carrying a lot of baggage is, is like stone, and you, you make a line in stone. It, it, the line can't go very deep, but boy, it stays there for a long time once you make it. And then, then take it the next stage, it's like, sand you know right. and it's e easier to make a deeper line and it doesn't stay as long next right. stage is like water you can easily make a deep line in water and it just immediately disappears and finally like air Whew. you can pass your whole arm through air but there's n no impression left so this whole thing about you know accumulating vasanas and impressions and then releasing vasanas and we we become eventually like lester as you've just described where we're like air uh, we have the experiences and perhaps even more vividly and profoundly, uh, richly, uh, than we had when we were more like a stone. And yet, there's no lasting impression. It's just like whoosh, passing through. I love that. I haven't heard that analogy before, yeah. but it's very accurate. You have and my that... permission to use it. Ah, thanks. <laughs> Is it yours? Or you... No, no. It's, an, it's one of those old stories. You know. Oh, it's an old teaching. In the, an you old, te know. It's an old you teaching know, I, analogy. I've been, recently, I've been... Uh, one of the things is I, I like to keep exploring Mm -hmm. Because both inwardly, it, it's, it's a constant inward 
exploration. Mm -hmm. But I'm also open to other tools and techniques, I, not because I feel like I need them as so much, but because I just want to really get the full picture. Yeah. And so I've been looking at more stuff from the East, and mm -hmm. it's a lot of the stuff from the East has no author. Yeah. It's been around so long, or they right. have they make up this author who lived for thousands of years, and they just attribute it all to him. Right. You, unfortunately, it's usually him. It's rarely <laughs> her. But that's just that's really inconsequential. But the 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 so it really you know the, when we're it's nice if you know the person to quote them, but often the quote is way beyond a person. Yeah, stuff's just been getting passed on for thousands of years. Yeah, it's been and yeah. and. The, but one thing to say of of the East, and sometimes people brush it off. They say, "Oh, yeah, we you know we need just a, a fresh knowledge for the West." But you know, these these guys have been at it for a long time, uh, and, and it's, they're I'm like the Eskimos who have thirty two words for snow. I'm told the Eskimo is a politically incorrect term, but you know what I mean. And and it's like they've they've nuanced the understanding of some of this stuff to such a fine degree that it's it's fascinating to explore. It is. It's fascinating. It's worth nothing else just to understand your own process. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I, I think the the Eastern stuff is just as brilliant as the stuff that's been discovered in the West, and uh, and a lot of it has thousands of years of 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 science, of experimentation, mm -hmm. of of report, which all the stuff that's going on in the West doesn't have. Right. And and so you need both. I think you need the creativity and the openness that comes from, you know, just this exploration that's happening in the West. And you also need to honor the roots, honor the traditions, where they have these yeah. traditions that go back thousands of years to say, ah, that's all based on, ah. you know, I mean, that's that's craziness. Well, you know, that's why it's nice that with today's communication and transportation, there's a a kind of a hybridization going on between the two in which the best of both worlds can emerge and yes. you know we can have something that's systematic and and scientific and and so on and yet has the sort of the depth of wisdom that the east has provide can provide yeah, it's, it's wonderful to have both right? yeah right I, I think we, we're very fortunate to live at this time because yeah very and much. and Lester, it sounds like, was conversant with Eastern stuff. You were quoting him earlier as referring to Vasanas and whatnot. Oh, yeah. So. He, after he, again, this particular lifetime, again, I, there's two schools of thought in the non-dual space about reincarnation. One mm -hmm. is, well, who's going to reincarnate, which is mm -hmm. obviously true. But at the same time, there are bundles of tendencies that not every baby is identical. Sure. Uh, even before you get to, to genetics and uh, and environment, they're, they're, it's just not the same. They, they come, we come in, it may just be a, a, a scoop of universal gunk that needs to be worked out, or it may be that particular streams stay together for long periods of time, which I think is what happens. I think so too. And I think there's an easy way of explaining it, which is that, fine, if you want to say the world is an illusion, then the illusory individuality reincarnates into new illusory bodies in, right. until, it, until it doesn't. Right. And, you know, but to say that reincarnation is impossible because there's nobody to reincarnate, it's like saying eating is impossible because there's nobody to eat. Right. But most of those teachers are still eating. They, they are. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and again, that's we're in the East, though. That there are plenty of teachers. I actually met a teacher. He wasn't even really a teacher. They call he was called an avidute. Uh -huh. uh, I've only been to India once. One of those but, naked sadhu kind of guys. Yeah, he was. Yeah. He had dreadlocks that were that were longer than his body. He mm -hmm. was living on a pile of prasad mm -hmm. that was rotting. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, he uh, he had. He smoked a beady or two a day and had a cup of tea a day, mm -hmm. and he'd been like that for 25 years. Huh. Uh, but being around him, it was like there wasn't even any love. Hmm. It was like standing at the edge of infinity. Hmm. Uh, and he's since passed. But the, uh, he was also in this interesting place in India. It was a place where there were it was a fishing community, and there were a lot of uh, Muslims and Hindus working in harmony together and that hadn't always been that way but when he moved into that spot mm. they'd been working in, they had been working in harmony and they both both communities completely respected him in fact the fishermen would occasionally be out fishing and they'd see him walking on the water wow <laughs> when he occasionally went for a stroll cool. and his family built a temple to him across the street which he never entered hmm. he just they 
they, he just lived on his pile of prasad and had very little awareness of the world. Mm. Uh, so it is possible to achieve, for, for the body mind to go into states where it doesn't need to take care of it. But it's, but it's, it's very rare for that to happen. Very rare. Right. And it shouldn't even be something that's to aspire to. The goal is the realization, the knowingness, the, the truth of who you are, and to live in an integrated way in life with that truth. Yeah, most of us don't aspire to sit on a pile of rotting fruit. By the way, uh, he, uh, there was no <laughs> smell, though. That was oh, really okay. Yeah. There was no, his, his, he had bathed in 25 years, mm -hmm. but his body actually sparkled. Yeah, I mean, I have this picture of Yogananda behind me. It's actually a, a audio tapes of your autobiography of a yogi, and that you know, most of the people listening to this have probably read that book. But it's full of stories of right. thing, things like that, and uh, you know, I wouldn't necessarily dismiss them as um, you know fan, fanciful no stories. They, it's, this stuff, anything's possible. Anything's possible. That's true. Yeah, but, but anyway, anyway yeah, back, back to, to Lester. To your analogy, which I really like. Oh, sure. What you find is that. That when you first start using the Sedona method, you're dealing with a water rock. Yeah. It's just how it feels. Yeah. Uh, and the, you feel, you know, sometimes you feel like you are a rock. <laughs> <laughs> Help, I'm a rock. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and, and it's very, very dense. But mm -hmm. what happens is, as you do this process, you, you turn the rock into, into sand. Mm -hmm. And then you, you start melting the rock. Yeah, the sand, it, it would have been glass, but it's not glass in this follow your analogy. It becomes water. You, you, turn, you turn, the, turn the sand into water, and then, the, then, the, then you evaporate the water. Mm. That's basically what happens as you do this process. It, mm -hmm. it, it, it naturally helps you uh, dissolve these places inside of you so that you become more and more transparent, more and more like air. And it and you also find that you naturally use this. You come in. Most people either to come to the method, they're either in uh, apathy, grief, or fear, uh, with a little lust, or they're in lust, anger, pride, courageousness. Uh, and what happens is the people in apathy, grief, and fear, with a little lust, start moving into anger, lust, anger, pride, courageousness. And the people in anger, pride, courageousness, as they release that, they start moving into acceptance and peace. And then towards the end, even that dissolves. Hmm. So you, and that's the equivalent to, to the gunas from the west, uh, from the east. The, hmm. the tamas is uh, apathy, grief fear with a little bit of lust. Rajas is lust, anger, pride, courageousness. Uh, and then courageousness, acceptance, and peace uh, is, is sattva. And when you're 50%, when you're in the middle of courageousness, you're 50% selfless and you're 50% selfish. You're 50% I, I can and 50% I can't. 50% uh, uh, loving and 50% hating. So you have to be all the way up into into courage, which is the at that borderline between sattva and rajas, or actually when you're starting to get into pure rajas, before you're actually starting to tip the scales into a, a more constructive state. Hmm. Uh, so what happens though is the sattva though, you don't have to, this is one, it's a gradual thing that happens in progression, but every time you use the process, you can be in Thomas or Rajas and be in apathy, grief, and fear, lust, anger, pride, courageousness. And you do the process, and in just minutes, you find yourself feeling acceptance and peace. Hmm. So you get this immediate shift in consciousness, which is, again, that really helps for Westerners. <laughs> yeah, they <laughs> like the immediate. No, I'm very patient. Yeah, sure, 20 years from now, I'll be more patient. He said, well, so? <laughs> that, that doesn't do me any good now. But with, when you use the Sedona method, you find that your life also, you may still have lots of rocks, but you'll find that certain parts of your life have already turned to air. Hmm. And in the presence of all that air, to stretch the metaphor, the rocks tend to dissolve more readily, yes. as opposed to when it's all rock. Right. And, and <laughs> yeah discern them. You right. start to see the rocks. Now, people don't always like that part. Mm. Because most of us live in so much denial that we don't want to deal with the things that we're denying. So part of the process, too, is you start to see your sense of limit, your limitations much more clearly. 
Mm. You see the remaining rock more clearly. And that's not always comfortable or pleasant because uh. most people want to pretend, you know, they hear about spirituality and they immediately want to pretend, well, I'm air. That's interesting. I, I remember the, one of the first times I sat in the close proximity of someone that I considered an enlightened person, as a saint. I, all of a sudden, my, I, I, my weakness, my inner weakness became so vividly obvious to me in a way that it hadn't been before, but in con somehow the contrast made it, made it so clear, you know. And, uh, you yeah, know over that, absolutely, and that's a, that's a natural thing that happens. That's mm. part of the uh, part of the benefit of being around someone who's a little, who's more airy than you are, is because if when two rocks meet, they just bump up against each other. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and it's not a lot of fun. But when 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 the, even when the rock meets sand, there's still more room. Mm -hmm. You know the. The, the rock maybe sometimes gets their way, maybe the sand sometimes gets their way, but there's more room. But the, the more flowing, the more open you are, the, that, that may make people around you feel insecure at first, mm -hmm. but it also sometimes makes them feel a lot more relaxed because you're not, you're not trying to change them. You're not trying to get to convince them about your point of view. You're not trying to, to Make them into something they're not. You're mm. loving them as their, as for their rocks, their sand, their water, and their air. Mm -hmm. Loving them for all of it, and you're also loving them because what they are is beyond that. Yeah. You're not seeing them as just the the bundle of tendencies, the bundle of stuff. right. Seeing the full spectrum of what they are. Exactly. So yeah. you know, so that is one of the benefits of knowing people who are maybe a little ahead of the game than you are. Mm. Uh, as long as you don't put them up on a pedestal. Uh, there's a learning that happens just in, in that inter, inter, uh, uh, non-verbal interchange. There's an osmosis that takes place. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, that's what Ramana meant, I think, when he said the greatest teaching is silence. You could just sit in his presence in that silence and, you know, it's seeped into your pores, so to speak. Right, right. <laughs> yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, so let's get back to Lester a little bit more. So you spent, like, decades commuting from New York to Sedona to take week-long... Well, actually, it wasn't uh, decades. Uh, uh, well, maybe, yeah, I, can, I, I met him in, in 76. He moved to, to... He was in New York at the time. Mm -hmm. I met him on 57th Street in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he used to do introductory uh, lectures. Well, actually, he, he would sit in on them. Someone else would usually do them. But they were done in an apartment on 57th Street. And so I did the process, and then I... I immediately wanted to, it was like everything else I'd ever done. I did the basic program in November of 1976, and they only had two other programs. They had an advanced program, which I did in January of 77, and then for a while they had an instructor program, which I did in February of, of, uh, of uh, 77. Right. <laughs> and, and I started leading workshops in my living room. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was only 22 years old. Mm -hmm. And I really was not ready, <laughs> so that didn't last. I I started to help out at the at their at their apartment office, and I started to do some workshops at home. And then it then it became mutually we mutually recognized that I needed to go out and live this for a while before I got got so involved. And and then they started doing what they called um, intensives in Arizona in '81. And so from '81 to '87. I, I commuted from New York City to uh, to uh, Sedona four times a year. I missed. They did four during a ten-year period. They did forty. I think I was at thirty-eight of them, <laughs> and they were week-long or nine-day in, intensives where you really did this work intensively. But I loved it so much. I just it was my highest priority. Mm. Uh, and then in eighty-seven. Uh, I, and during this whole 10 year period where you're doing that, I mean, what sort of changes were you undergoing? You must have been going through uh, a lot. I, I, uh, every part of my life changed. Every single part. My relationships got better. Uh, my health got better. Uh, uh, my sense of happiness and joy and peace, no matter what was going on around me, just became more and more profound. I remember the first time I ever 
uh, I actually started having experiences of non-duality and peace when I was very young. But then I f kind of forgot about that and then got really lost in the, the whole preteen, teenager years and then into college. And then in college, I, I read Autobiography of a Yogi. Mm -hmm. And there is a river by Edgar Casey, and then like my whole life did a 180, and then I've been a, I've been an, uh, a, a rabid uh, lover of truth ever since. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, uh, and then uh, Wester actually, when I met him, early 77, Wester gave me teachings of Ramana Maharshi, and said this this is the closest to what I teach is this Eastern teacher, so I would highly recommend you read this. So I've been a fan of Ramana since 77 when Lester introduced me to him. Mm -hmm. But uh, so in 87, I moved to Arizona uh, to try to help Lester with the organization he had established in Arizona. And then I moved to Sedona in 89 uh, for a couple of years. Then I moved back to Phoenix. Uh, and then somewhere. I think it was in 91 or 2, I, I, I went from attending retreats to leading them. I, think it was, I can't remember if it was 91 or 2. But, uh, so Wester was still alive and then in 94 he passed away. And in the early 90s he gave all his teachings to me and he told me, and I actually wrote him on this, I said, Wester, what? Me? I, what are you, crazy? <laughs> I'm just a student. Why, why would you want me to take these teachings and he was absolutely insistent and I said well we, why don't we form a nonprofit and the nonprofit no nope, I want you to personally hold the, the teachings so he gave the teachings to me in the early 90s and then uh, and he also said to me that they will evolve when I learned this when I when he gave me the teaching it's just that first way of letting go dropping mm -hmm. the other four ways of letting go all evolved from from just working with people it's what happens spontaneously. Would you say it's evolving still? I mean, of kind course. Of, yeah. I'm going to be doing a retreat in uh, in about 10 days. Mm -hmm. People are coming from all over the world. Actually, some people are going to be attending uh, via uh, remotely. We're, we're, for the first time ever, we're streaming. Yeah. Teleprompt, televise it, yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, I, uh, for the past few months, I had, things have been coming to me like, oh, well, do this with them. Okay. And now, by the way, when those things come, I just put them aside. Hmm. I, I'm going, we'll see. But when I show up in the room, if that's needed... It comes. It comes. Yeah. And are there people, uh, you know, who come to this thing now who've been doing it almost as long as you have or, you know... Yes, there's, there's a few. For quite a few years. There's some... Uh, uh, Enrica James is one of the original Sedona Method instructors, and she stopped mm -hmm. for a while, and I had her start instructing again two or three years ago. And she took the, the basic program in, in October of 1976, and she is actually going to be assisting at this retreat. Mm -hmm. And so there's all varying degrees of people who get into it, stay for a while, go away, come back, or, or you know, they stay, or it's, you know, it's, all over the world. Sure, as the spirit moves them. I heard you. I heard you say at one point that you'd like to get this videotape out to about one percent of the world's population. Yeah, that's so, not going to happen. Uh, actually, you know, Marshy used to say that about TM. One percent. Eventually, he got back to square root of one percent would do it. <laughs> <laughs> and he had physicists telling him that if you know, like in a laser, if, if only the square root of one percent of the light waves become coherent, then all the others kind of you know, fall into line. So maybe that can be your goal. <laughs> Actually, it's interesting. My goals for the Sedona Method have been falling away. Huh. Uh, the, the more non-duality takes me, the less I can hold on to even those goals. Mm. Uh, so I, I think it's an amazing tool and it's helped hundreds of thousands of people. But I feel like I'm just an instrument. So if it's supposed to get out to a lot more people, it will. And if it's not, it won't. I, I, a lot of my rajas to get it out mm -hmm. has, has been dissolving. So yeah. it's it's going to get out or it won't. Yeah. A few years and from now, you might be just sitting on a prasad heap smoking biddies, you know? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> I really don't. The truth is my life now is so exquisite every mm. moment that... Uh, 
I, I, I trust that I'm being wed to what is appropriate, both for this body-mind and for the Sedona method. And the other thing I did a couple of years ago, I, uh, for many years, from Western Dine in 94, 96, my wife and I started a company called Sedona Training Associates. And it went through its Rajasic phase, and we were reaching... Again, when Wester was alive, by the t even from 1976, or he actually started in 73, I met him in 76, but from 76 to, to 96, when, when, or 94, when he gave me all the techniques and said, you continue, and actually even until, while he was still alive, he, he died in 90, I'm sorry, getting my dates confused, 91, 94, he passed away. When he passed away, only 7,000 people had done the process. Mm -hmm. Uh, since then, hundreds of thousands of people have done it. Mm. Uh, and uh, if it's supposed to keep getting bigger, it will. But about two years ago, I, I gave the, the entire business operations to another organization. Mm. And I am still the figurehead, and I still do the, the, all the, the, sem the, the seminars and the products and promotions and all that kind of stuff. I still help with all that. But I don't have anything to do with the business or, or its goals or any of that. It's mm. somebody else now. Oh, okay. It's really and is there is there, I mean, usually organizations, spiritual organizations, when they get to a certain size, there's all kinds of craziness that happens. You know, schism, schisms within them, and you know, conflicts, and uh, you know the story. I mean, it happens in almost every t in well, every it, every spiritual started, movement. Have you got have you guys gone through that kind of thing? Wester was alive. Oh, uh, did it. Oh yeah, there, there was lawsuits. There was a lawsuits. Group of people who sued him because they didn't. To get enlightenment. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> That's a good one. And and there was also the organization was not really run that well, so there was a whole bankruptcy and mm. and they the people who were suing for not getting enlightenment ganged up joined the people who were part of the bankruptcy and it was a mess. <laughs> so it was a complete mess. And it was an amazing growth experience for me because I was in the middle of this whole thing. I was working as a volunteer for his organization, Sedona Institute. And they didn't just sue him and the organization, they sued everyone involved. So here oh. I was, a volunteer, and it was a $22 million lawsuit. Wow. It ended up in a bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but here I was, I didn't have anything. So what do they take? Can't get blood from a stone, right? <laughs> but it was an amazing growth experience. Uh, it, was, it was hell for a couple of years. But by the time it started resolving itself, there was so much that had been just kind of ripped out of this body mind mechanism. It was like a quantum leap, even though it was a very unpleasant one. Well, that kind of reminds me of something that you mentioned, you know, in the recordings and that I also experience in life, which is just about everything becomes grist for the mill, you know. Um, you can go through all kinds of intense stuff, but it's actually if we if we understand that we live in an intelligent universe, then this stuff doesn't ha isn't just happening capriciously. It's happening because there are lessons inherent in it. Oh, no, no, absolutely. I, my, my feeling is there is no accidents. Right, right. And there are no mistakes. Mm -hmm. uh, it, and that's my, it's my deep knowingness. And everything's an opportunity for growth. And, and everything is an opportunity for growth as long as you don't try to figure out what the op what the opportunity is. It's kind of funny. If you if you lead with your head, you try to figure out well what messages are they is this thing you just spin. Yeah, they say karma is unfathomable. Yeah, completely unfathomable. Right. So what we do in our seminars is I tell people let go of wanting to figure it out. Mm -hmm. If you if you really let that go, and, and you let go of the the, the emotion, the thoughts, the feelings, the, the trauma. If there's a lesson, it it will reveal itself to you. You don't have to go looking for it. I yeah. think one of the things that happens so much in self help is people will hold on to suffering for years because they think they haven't learned the lesson yet or they haven't gotten the message. Hmm. And that's all unnecessary. Hmm. Yeah. Um so there's so many more things we could talk about, but I some I always reach this point where we're nearing two hours. And I think, okay, we should. Oh my see. god! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know. I had no uh, idea that much time went by. Yeah, as Groucho said, uh, "Time flies like an arrow. Fruit flies like a banana." <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, we still have a bit more time. But, um, and what I'm inclined to ask you is. Uh, you know, where do you see, 
I mean, you've already sort of described this in talking about how you deal with the organization and everything, but everybody has a a next horizon, you know, and they they have a a sort of, I mean, sure, we're living in the now, but there's a sort of a sense as we go from day to day of what's unfolding for us, you know, what how, how the quality of the, of the deepening that seems to be taking place. So could you describe that in your own life and and do you do you still specifically use the Sedona method or has it become more subtle than that and almost a kind of an automatic way of functioning? Uh, so there's several things. I'll start with the West and work backwards. The Sedona method has been so integrated into my experience that my tendency when when tendencies or, or issues or whatever arise in consciousness, which they still do, uh, is most of it just releases by itself. Spontaneously. It's all spontaneous. Yeah. So that's one thing that's happening. Like a line, line is, on air. Right. <laughs> it, it actually is like that. A lot. Uh-huh. There's, there's, uh, I'm sure I still have a few stones I haven't found, and I'm always actively looking. Mm-hmm. And occasionally the sand gets in the works a little bit. Can you create new stones by looking, or, or is, it, is that not a, a problem? I don't think you can create stones from looking, but you can certainly create water or sand. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like you can stir up something that doesn't even need to be yeah, stirred up. Yeah, right? I, I, probably. Yeah. So most of my, air, most of my life is air, mm-hmm. and sometimes it's humid air, <laughs> and occasionally I'll find a little sand or, or little, a stone here or there. Right. Phoenix uh, has those big sandstorms. Right, it does. They, they even have a name. I don't remember what they're called now. Yeah. Uh, fortunately, Sedona is far enough away from Phoenix that most of those storms never affect us. <laughs> Although it's hot at the moment. It's about 100 degrees. It's going to be 100 degrees today, which is unusual for here. Usually, we're 10 to 15 degrees cooler than mm. Phoenix. But Phoenix is probably going to be 115 today. <laughs> uh. But anyway, so... so and I'll occasionally pull out the process if I just if I find a little sand, or the, the air has gotten very humid, or or I find a little pebble somewhere. I'll take out the process and use it. And then the other thing that I'm that I'm doing at the moment is I'm really been spending a lot of focus on re, on, on on integrating my energetic systems. Hmm. How so? Uh, just. Uh, with through yoga and just honoring Shakti and things like that, so a lot of that has been happening spontaneously, hmm. and some of it's been focused where I'm doing practices that support that. Did you get the sense that they were unintegrated in some way, and this moved no, you to want to integrate really them? Interesting. Uh, I didn't even know there was an issue there, hmm. but I but I was attracted to uh, some yeah. Uh, 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 some information from the East that really helped open up a whole other world or a whole other window uh, for me to start exploring. So I've cool. been exploring that window. And Want to mention uh, what it was or would you rather not? Well, the only reason I don't want to is it's one of these things that they can only handle a very small number of people. Uh-huh. And I wouldn't want to mention it in a public forum like this. Okay. Although I just did. Now I'm going to be inundated. But I'll Yeah, wait. what was it? What was it? <laughs> <laughs> but the, the bottom line is it's it's something that that uh, only about 20 people do it a year. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, so it's really not a, a wide open thing, and they they take only very serious uh, seekers. Mm-hmm. But anyway, but well, I just want to say in passing that I think it's cool that you admit that. There's a lot of people who are heads of spiritual organizations that wouldn't dream of admitting publicly that they're actually doing some practice that they might find helpful other than the one they teach, you know, because oh, yeah, it sort of implies that their teaching is deficient if they're doing no, something in else. Fact, the, the one thing I will say about them is they're, they're incredibly supportive of this work because mm-hmm. they think it, it's one, is incredible preparation for the the, the east and end game, mm-hmm. but also there's such a harmony between what we do and what they do that that's how, how part of the reason I'm able to really uh, focus on it is because it, there's there's a huge harmony there and a lot of what they do happens spontaneously you know in my work uh, but it, it's but for me specifically I needed something more focused okay and I'm not embarrassed to tell, to say that because it's really improved my ability to share my work just from being open to this other modality. Nice. Beautiful. So, And so what my living experience is now is I, in the background there's this sense of, 
I like the cosmic sound. I hear it all the time. <clears throat> uh, I go between states of bliss and peace most of the time. The, the non-dual uh, state is also here most of the time. And uh, and I'm exploring that now from a, from a whole new perspective. Uh, not just using my set of tools, but a whole other set of tools. So it's, and it's my goal, there is a goal there, there's still a goal there. <laughs> it's interesting. There's very few goals left in life, but there's still one there. And that my goal there is, is twofold. One is to, uh, uh, in the East they call it Nirvakalpa mm -hmm. and Sahaj. Mm -hmm. So uh, most of the people who are, are the, 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 the people in the non-dual space here, and especially in the United States, have experienced neither. Uh, they're not living sahaj. They might think they are, but they're not. And uh, you're referring to forms of samadhi. The, yes. The, these are like adjectives to refer to right. states, so, states so of basically, oneness. Basically, there are varying degrees of, of samadhi. So mm -hmm. what I, I Which means evenness of intellect, by the way. So sama yes. means evenness and buddhi means intellect. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it, it's interesting. And again, what I've been teaching this, all these years is, is an amazing preparation for samadhi. Mm hmm uh, so, uh, so I've been going into samadhi a lot, uh, and just sort of eyes closed, pure samadhi state. Yes. Yeah. And, and also eyes open. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. yeah, while I driving your car, down. right, or yeah, walking your dog, or whatever. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. So my goal is is I'm not co I, 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 again. Ramana, so the, the sahaj has not been achieved. The, Ramana talks about the natural state where. Yeah. Where there, where there's no longer even the ability to do any kind of process because there's no one because there's genuine no one to process. Right. You're not just saying that. Yeah. <laughs> so I, that has not been achieved, mm -hmm. but it's it is my goal. Nice. Uh, and so uh, there, and I my other goal is to is to keep working on this instrument until it's, it is that way all the time and then, then see if I can bring that completely as an integrated as everything else I've been teaching. Mm. And I've been starting to do pieces of that but, uh, and it's already coming out in, our, in, in the seminars like the one I'll be doing soon. So, so you're saying if you achieve those goals personally and you know some people cringe when they hear that kind of terminology, achieving goals. Oh my God! But if you if if you achieve those goals personally, then your natural inclination would be to incorporate them into what you teach, so that others may well, not, do so. Not, not not incorporate so much, uh, because the teaching itself is integrous. It's interesting as I've been, at, as I've been experiencing samadhi more and more. It hasn't really changed my teaching. It's just where I'm teaching from. Right. Uh, so, which is interesting. It's another validation for me that I must be must have been on the right path this past 35 years to be mm -hmm. doing what I'm doing. Uh, but the uh, so uh, and I couldn't possibly teach these Eastern teachings that I've been studying because that would require uh, a whole other lifetime of study. Yeah, it's not your and, toolkit. And, I, and it's, right. it's not my toolkit. So right. what I intend to do is not integrate any of it. Okay. And I also think that would be out of integrity. Because mm -hmm. uh, uh, it, it's not my lineage, mm -hmm. uh, but what what's happening is it's seeping into everything I do, mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and so I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens. And and again, the other thing that may happen from that, I may reach a point where I stop teaching. That's a very real possibility. Uh, but so far, uh, uh, it it's only been, been deepening what I do with people. Nice. Well, I really appreciate your candor. Um, it's it's refreshing. I mean, it's, it's a lot of teachers hold their cards really close to their chest, you know, and they they wouldn't. And I've said this a minute ago. But they wouldn't admit that they've gone off to explore some other thing or that their experience is evolving. I don't know. It's, there's this kind of subtle tendency to maintain an image, and I I find it really endearing that you're not that you don't do that. I, again, why protect something that isn't real? Right. <laughs> if, 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 you're, if it's one of the things I say in my seminars is if, it, uh, if you're protecting something, it's not real. So if you even think you have to protect this image as the teacher, 
You're right. protecting an illusion. Why protect it? Let it dissolve. Mm. It, it, and again, if it requires maintenance, uh, uh, Jerry Stocking, who I, I, don't, I don't know if you know who he is, but mm. years ago he was very popular. He did NLP on himself intensively, mm. and for a year and a half he was in a very altered state, and then it all crashed. This whole world crashed around him. But he has some great quotes, and one of them is that reality requires no maintenance. Mm, nice, yeah. And that's been my experience. If it's real, it doesn't require maintenance, mm. and also doesn't require protection. If you're re-protecting it, it's not real. That's good. Shall we close on that, or you want to make some kind of closing thoughts or remarks? Oh, the, I, the only thing I would just say is just to come back to, to something that's very dear to my heart, and which mm -hmm. is that basically the, the, the message you've probably heard on this channel more than once is that you already are what you're seeking. Yes. And honestly, that's my living experience, mm -hmm. that I've ne yet to meet someone that isn't already whole, that mm -hmm. isn't already complete, that isn't already enough as they are. And s just know that you can honor and live that, but still also honor whatever your process is. So follow your heart when it comes to, 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 your, to, the, to the teachers you interact with. Follow your heart when it also comes to teachings. And don't think because it has a form to it, it's wrong or bad. Know that if it has a form for you, that's what's appropriate for you in this moment. There is no one right way for everyone. And so just let yourself be open to what your heart tells you is the next thing. Because in my experience, your intuitive knowingness of your heart never lies. Your mind is lying continuously. It doesn't know anything else. It's all a bunch of lies. <laughs> but, your, and, but your heart, your intuitive knowingness, that, that sense of clear reason, which in the East they call booty, Mm -hmm. uh, when it's clean, when it's crystal, then it's also uh, uh, a good representation. It's, it's not getting in the way, but the way most minds are, they're getting in the way all the time. But rather than follow your mind, follow your heart. That's a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. And just know that the goal is possible. If you're, if you're suffering anywhere in your life, you don't have to suffer. It's not noble. You can be free of whatever your, your your whatever your experience of suffering is. You can be really be free of it, no matter what it is. And the goal of of total freedom, of living life as love, as peace, as joy, is attainable to you. Not just this this body mind or or the my interviewer or all the other people you've watched here. Don't put any of us up on a pedestal. If we can do it, we're not special. If we can do it, you can do it. And again, it's been my experience through everything I've done for the past 35 years that it's this is contagious and it's not special. Mm. So follow your heart and go for it. Great stuff. Yeah, beautiful words. Um, I think people are really going to enjoy hearing all this. So thanks. This has been wonderful. Um, let me make a few concluding remarks. Um, I've been speaking with Hale Dwoskin, who is the primary you know, teacher of the Sedona Method. And um, I'll be linking to Hale's website, where you'll find plenty of information about how to you know, learn more about the Sedona Method and you know, get into it if you like. Um, there's a book you can get, and there's a CD, a DVD you can watch, and all kinds of things. And um, <laughs> so, there's, and it, there's always stuff. Yeah, there's all this stuff. And it seems like you've structured it in a way that people can dip their toe in or they can just dive in headlong or any, anywhere in between. There's, yes. you, know, you can sort of find a niche that works for you and, yes. and take advantage of it. And uh, this interview has been one in an ongoing series. You can find them all archived at batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, which is an acronym for Buddha at the gas pump. But I left the, I left the A in at the end, G-A-P, rather than just G-P, because otherwise you wouldn't be able to pronounce it. Um, <laughs> unless, unless you spoke Sanskrit, then, then you would, there would be some sound for that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, go to Batgap, and you'll find all the interviews I've done. Um, there is an alphabetical list on the right hand side and there's a menu under other stuff where you can see them all listed chronologically and there are a few other things there that I'd like to just run through. Um, one is 
a chat group that springs up around each interview and usually doesn't stay on the topic of the interview, but you know, <laughs> I, I can't bother to police it. But uh, you might f feel free to participate in that. And there is a uh, link to an audio podcast if you'd like to get this on your iPod and listen to it while you're commuting or something. There's a donate button, which I appreciate people clicking if they can. There's a link to an email sign-up thing, so you'll be notified by email each time there's a new interview. And also... There, under the, also under the other stuff menu, there's a volunteer opportunities link. And if you look at that page, there's something I'm racking my brains with right now, which is trying to, trying to get a web a camcorder to work with Skype. And so if you have the sort of technical wherewithal to get into that kind of stuff, I could maybe use some help from somebody. And uh, put other things up on that page as they develop. For instance, there's a, a team of people who are doing uh, transcriptions and translations so that on, on YouTube you can sort of see this in your native language. Somebody just did one in Polish. So in any case, there's all that there. And um, I think that about does it. So, <laughs> so thanks a lot, Hale. Yeah, thank you. It's really been fun this, talking to you. Likewise. Yeah. And thanks to those who have been listening or watching, and we'll see you next week.